Okay, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Although I fear the talk may not have any similarity to the title discernible to anybody except Mohammed. Um, I hope that won't be true of everything in the talk. Okay, so, uh, so let me start with some context, not about Kavanaugh homology, but just about Fleur theory, um, which we've seen somehow maybe less of than I'd anticipated. Um, so, so suppose I have a symplectic manifold. Uh, you could take it to be closed, in which case perhaps monotone is safe, or you could take it to be exact. Um, so the set of questions I'm going to ask are already interesting in situations where there are no transversality issues. Um, that's not to say they're not equally interesting in other issues, but it's not the focus of the talk. Um, okay, so um, let's fix a finite collection of uh, closed Lagrangian submanifolds at least typically closed, they won't always be closed, um, inside X. And, uh, well, so Fleur theory somehow starts by saying that after picking a compatible or taming almost complex structure J and perhaps a large amount of other perturbation data that I'm going to suppress, um, we get sort of operations mu sub k appropriate degree shift acting on the Fleur complexes, which if we assume we're allowed a little perturbation are generated by presumed transverse intersection points of these Lagrangians, um, which counts sort of in the usual schematic, uh, holomorphic polygons. with sort of intersection points as follows. So that's sort of mu k applied to a tuple of intersections. The output intersection y is counted with a coefficient that is given by counting rigid holomorphic polygons whose Lagrangian boundaries map to the Lagrangian submanifolds Li0, Li1, round to Lik. Uh, and these satisfy the sort of quadratic A infinity equations. Um, which again, schematically, one writes in this form that for any given S, the sort of sum assigned sum of the different ways that you can use two of the mu i operations to eat up your s inputs vanishes. Okay? And we have these operations, say, for k at least 1. Not interested in curvature particularly today. And the simplest of these relations says that mu 1 compose mu 1 vanishes. So We get cochain complexes and we get sort of Fleur cohomology as the differential. Um, and the next simplest equation tells us that uh, mu2 is a chain map 
So it descends to cohomology. And in particular, I get a natural ring out of my finite collection of Lagrangians, um, where here somehow, you know, if the indices are such that there isn't an obvious triangle product, if they don't match up correctly, then the notation just says you formally set that to be zero. And if there is a well-defined mu two, sort of, you know, when you're looking at a tensor product HF L1, L2, tensor HF L2, L3, you apply the triangle product. But this ring carries sort of remnants of these higher chain level operations. Exactly that. So let me call this thing A, such that A is really sort of the cohomology of what I'll call script A, which is an A-infinity algebra. Okay. So if you prefer, I will probably not be consistent about these two, um, this notational difference, although it is quite helpful. Uh, but an important point is that the higher order operations are not sort of defined by chain maps, you know, once this S is bigger than two, these operations don't just involve mu one and mu S minus one. So these further operations don't descend to cohomology. They depend very much on the particular choice of J and other perturbation data. So we'd like to understand what they are. And perhaps the simplest question you could ask is when are they in a suitable sense all trivial? Okay, so as a sort of the natural equivalence relation, for instance, the natural notion of equivalence coming from varying your perturbation data, or your choice of J. Hey, let me just say that, uh, so this cohomology thing, mm -hmm. and all these operations, mm -hmm. and then after what you said, these operations don't descend to cohomology. Right, so the point is that the operations are not chain maps, so they don't tautologically descend to cohomology. Oh, oh, but there's, but there's a sort of system, a purely algebraic mechanism coming from homological perturbation theory that will let you push these operations that are naturally geometrically defined at chain level down to cohomology. But once you've done that, they're no longer geometric. The things that the cohomology algebra inherits aren't actually counting curves, which makes it hard to get at them. Actually, sorry, I'm going to expand. I might be getting at your punchline, but of course there are geometric compositions, multi-compositions. Are you going to say something about the relationship to them? No. No. Do you have a hunch of what, right? I mean, if you just fix the complex structure, you get well-defined maps on your model, right? So, are we um, expecting them to be equal somehow? Or? I'm not sure why we would get well-defined maps on Flerko homology from these counts of polygons with many sides. I mean, the natural boundary structure to the associahedron involves... No, 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 no. I mean, the Schwarz, Schwarz multiplication, except with boundary conditions. The Schwarz multiplication? You mean the, para you mean the triangle product? Absolutely, no, so, so that's here. There's a completely well-defined product. Right, but you can do more than a pair of pants. You're just fixing the complex structure, and then... Of course, you could try to count... Sorry, perhaps what you're saying is, if I prescribe the conformal structure on my disk with many boundary points, then I will get a well-defined operation. Um, you will get a well-defined homology. Yeah, I mean, but, it, but that's not, so the trouble is that in making that essentially arbitrary choice, you leave the world of the algebraic structures that have been useful in comparisons from other parts of mathematics to other structures coming up, for instance, in mirror symmetry. So 
those are essentially different things because you're counting the rigid points in a moduli space in which you don't have a very inconformal parameter instead of morally the rigid points in a moduli space over a family of complex structures. So I don't think that there's some passage between those two systems of invariance. So probably for pure degree reasons, they can't be an example of what you're That's actually right. getting. That's right. Perfectly. Actually, Katrin, they're, they're just compositions of products. Right. Yes. On yes. homology, they're, they're just oh, compositions damn. of products. <laughs> <general>. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So the, the natural equivalence relation um, is to consider, so suppose I have, you know, so maybe the natural equivalence relation for A infinity algebras uh, is to consider, you know, sequences of maps, sort of, all right, I can't decide whether I have subscripts or superscripts. Uh, which again satisfy some quadratic relations. So I guess looking at endomorphisms here, so let's just say that. Okay. So, okay, so the, the shape of this formula doesn't matter. The point I want to emphasize is that, you know, we have an algebra which is a nice typical object of linear algebra, but there's a lot of slightly mysterious higher order data and the natural equivalence relation we should think about is something intrinsically non-linear. It's not given by, you know, a map from A to A which entwines structures, it's given by a sequence of multilinear maps which can have arbitrarily many inputs. Okay? So in particular, it's perfectly possible that two different A infinity structures are related by an A infinity equivalent which on the level of cohomology is just the identity and does nothing and in which everything interesting is hidden in these higher order terms. So from that point of view, a sort of basic question you want to think about is when is an A infinity algebra A formal in the sense of equivalent to the same underlying algebra but equipped with the structure in which all the higher products are zero? Ivan, could you write a little bit bigger, please? Uh, yes. So, so today's talk is somehow about this question. Um, for expositional reasons, example two will come first. Um, uh, but it will take a little bit of time to set up. So, so let me consider a k. Oh gosh, I guess I've been using a for algebra. I always call this AK. Maybe I can call it XK. Uh, be the affine surface given by this equation in C3. This is um, what many people will recognize as the AK Milner fiber. So where PK is a degree K polynomial with distinct roots. And do you want XK minus 1? Yeah, OK. <laughs> what do I want to do? 
You just want to listen to what else is I I wasn't disputing that she was correct. I was wondering which I wanted to normalize. Um, okay, and this has a projection coming from projection to the z coordinate to the c plane, and there's a standard construction of Lagrangian spheres in this surface due to Donaldson called the matching cycle construction. So I have a bunch of critical values of this projection, places where pk of z vanishes, and the fiber looks like a singular conic, x squared plus y squared equals zero, where the generic fiber is just a smooth conic, something that looks like t star s1. And if I pick a path between two of these critical values that avoids all the others, say gamma, then by thinking about the sort of circle fiber, which is the equator of T star S1, inside all of the fibers over the interior points of gamma, which collapses down at the end points to a single point, uh, then what I get is a family of circles collapsing at both ends to a point, which is a two-sphere, which is actually Lagrangian inside xk minus one. Uh, so now we want to introduce something mildly more intimidating. So, um, So inside the Kth Hilbert scheme of, yeah, it's just... Has my writing shrunk again, Chris? Was it Chris who asked? Maybe it wasn't. Okay. Uh, uh, let yk inside the Hilbert scheme of k points on this surface be the open subset uh, of subschemes which, after you project them from this surface down to C, still have length k. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. Um, if the Hilbert scheme doesn't mean anything to you, I'll say a word about it presently. Okay, and the nice feature about this open subset is that it's an affine variety, in particular an exact symplectic manifold. I don't actually know what it means to project a subscheme. So the point is that I start with a subscheme here, okay? So what I want to be true is that when I look at the... What I want to rule out is any subscheme which contains a infinitesimal direction killed by the projection. So what I actually do is inside, if k was 2 inside Hilb 2, two I know what to do. there would be a relative symmetric product, okay, which I want to throw out. In general, I want to remove the image of Hilb k minus 2 times the relative symmetric product in Hilb 2. Okay. So, so what is the Hilbert scheme if you haven't met them? It's just a desingularization of the kth symmetric product. So you should really think that we're dealing with sort of k-tuples of points which may not be distinct on this affine surface, um, but when they come together we're remembering something about the manner in which they came together. Uh, so the length of the subscheme is, you know, if they were supported at different points it would just be the number of points in the subscheme. So we're looking at k-tuples. And in general, you're taking the dimension of the vector space, which is somehow the ring of functions on the subscheme.
okay, so um, a crossingless matching. row of 2k points um, is just a bunch of arcs that connect them in pairs which are pairwise disjoint and such that the whole thing lives in a half plane, say the lower half plane. So there's one on six points, here's another. It's not hard to persuade yourself there are finitely many given by the Catalan number. Each of these arcs, I said, defined a Lagrangian submanifold in x 2k minus 1, and if I have k of these arcs, I get k Lagrangian two spheres, and, well, the products of those Lagrangian two spheres as a submanifold of this complex surface to the k lies far away from the diagonal. If I have one point on each of these k arcs, I'm far from the diagonal. Uh, on the other hand, the symmetric product was only singular near the diagonal. So such a picture defines a Lagrangian submanifold inside this space yk. So you said yk is a fine, and uh, therefore it's uh, exact symplectic. I understand that away from all the diagonals, I have a canonical symplectic structure on the symmetric product. Are we saying that that's the one that also agrees with the one we pull back from a fine embedding of some sort? Or... Outside some pre-chosen neighborhood of the big diagonal. You can make it exactly that. Sorry. And it's this one with which with respect to which this would be. So that's then enough for this to say, for this to be true. Okay, so I said there are finitely many of these crossingless matchings. Uh, each one is giving me a Lagrangian submanifold in this exact symplectic manifold. And then the theorem that Mohammed and I proved a couple of years ago is that the algebra of the flavor that I introduced before is formal in characteristic zero. Um, so if we do all our Flerko homology over Q, say, uh, and <clears throat> so I'm not going to tell you how we proved it. Uh, the point of the talk is um, to suggest various strategies by which we might have proved it or thought about it, which I think remain interesting open avenues. Uh, so say more about what you're talking about. So I was going to say one remark is that um, this is relevant to a certain geometric model of the link invariant called Kavanov homology. But I'm not going to have time to expand on that today. Um, do you have analogous pictures whose formality is relevant for uh, geometric models of other homology theories? I mean, there would be an obvious conjecture for the SLN homology theories. Uh, beyond that, we don't have a conjectural geometric picture at all that I know of, not within symplectic geometry. You're trying to say what the conjecture is for the SLN? Uh... Sure. I mean, there's the description of an SLN symplectic geometry based theory given by Cyprian Manolescu, which takes place inside, you know, a fiber of the adjoint quotient to a certain nilpotent matrix with appropriately chosen Jordan blocks. You can again associate canonical Lagrangian submanifolds to that index by, for instance, the components of its compact core as a quiver variety, and the conjecture would be that the corresponding algebra is formal. The theorem, does that help you prove the relevance to the homology or prove something about the homology? The theorem enables us to prove that a link invariant defined via 
a braid group action on this space by symplectomorphisms as a certain FLERCO homology group is isomorphic to Kavanov homology in characteristic zero. Whether... I would have said the theorem by itself proves the existence of, essentially proves a spectral sequence. And then we need to go beyond. There's a spectral sequence anyway without this. Okay. Just from the existence of the long exact triangle. So I wouldn't say that. Um, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, So what I would like to outline are two alternative approaches to thinking about this, one of which is based around the idea that things should be formal for good algebraic reasons, and one of which is based around the idea that things should be formal for good geometric reasons, where our proof was in some sense, you know, comparatively ad hoc. I mean, I like it a lot because it worked, but um, that's perhaps not widely shared view. One of the previous times I wrote a paper with Mohammed, he shortly afterwards gave a talk at IAS in which he described our main result as pointless nonsense. So it's all slightly nervous. <laughs> okay, so. So let's go back to example one. Uh, we had this nice Milner fiber before I threw this monstrous Hilbert scheme at you. And there's an obvious collection of Lagrangian spheres in this Milner fiber, which meet according to the sort of A k minus one or k intersection pattern. Uh, due to my stupidity, I can't see those spheres. Can you draw them? In this yeah, I will in a second. So, so. So I said that I had this Lefschetz vibration uh, with k critical values and that a path between two critical values defined a Lagrangian two-sphere in the total space. So I just take the straight line paths consecutively having chosen my polynomial pk to have sort of real distinct roots. And I get a collection of Lagrangians L1 up to L k minus 1. Um, OK, and so this, uh, so it's a theorem, quite an old theorem now due to Seidel and Thomas, uh, that um, the corresponding algebra is formal. Okay. But they prove this in sort of a relatively drastic way, which is to say that they prove, in fact, that it's intrinsically formal. Meaning that any A infinity structure you could fit on this algebra is equivalent to the trivial one. It just supports no interesting structure at all. Okay. So, well, if that's true, that's a feature of just the algebra itself, so it should be amenable to somehow methods of pure algebra, and indeed there's a sufficient condition for intrinsic formality formulated in terms of Hochschild cohomology. So, so recall a graded algebra A has a Hochschild cohomology group sort of it's actually naturally bi-graded Uh, and it's obtained as the cohomology of a complex whose terms involve looking at multilinear maps from powers of A to A. So, 
the sort of chain level thing is kind of a product of hom a to the j a in degree i minus j. So that looks a lot like an A-infinity structure itself. An A-infinity structure was built out of multilinear maps from powers of A to A of appropriate degree. So sort of an A-infinity structure is an element of CC2 with this grading. And um, the sort of observational theorem of Seidel and Thomas, which is just, not just, but it's a nice piece of algebra, they showed that if HH sort of 2AA vanishes or slightly weaker, or in fact, HH sort of um, 2 comma S minus 2. S2 minus SAA vanishes for all S at least 3. So that's somehow all of these bigraded pieces except the very smallest, then A is intrinsically formal. So I have too many F's? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's sufficient, not necessary. <clears throat> OK, so, you know, knowing this um, and wanting to prove the formality theorem on the left, one sits down and starts computing Hochschild homology. Um, if you're like me, one gets nowhere. So you write to Mike Kavanoff, who writes a computer program, who computes Hochschild homology, and you find that, um, sort of unfortunately, uh, sort of HH2 of AK, AK, where this is the algebra corresponding to working in this space YK, um, grows in rank exponentially with K. And on the other hand, the sort of remaining piece we're allowed to keep, HH, sort of 2 comma 0, um, that's, uh, that, that's just the center of the algebra, and that's sort of rather small, grows linearly in K. Okay, so, so you certainly can't prove that theorem using intrinsic formality, but um, so maybe I should mentioned that fairly recently, Etku and Leckerly showed that the uh, sort of type D um, sort of Dinkin type algebras are formal um, in characteristic not equal to 2. And maybe they conjecture that the type E are formal in characteristic not equal to 2, 3, and 5. Um, so, you know, whilst this is one very special situation, sort of intrinsic formality seems to hold in at least a bunch of other cases related to surfaces. And then there's a conjecture due to Stroppel, somehow grew out of conversations with Mohammed and I, that um, there's a canonical enlargement No, canonical as of it, easy to describe, naturally natural from a geometric point of view. Um, AK sitting inside, let me call it AK hat, such that HH2 of AK hat is just the center of AK hat, which is actually just H2 of this space YK. And this enlargement simply corresponds to throwing in a few more Lagrangian submanifolds, which needn't be compact. So in xk minus 1, 
I said that there were Lagrangians associated to parts like this. So gamma defines a two sphere. But I could also consider just a path which runs out to infinity along a straight line. And such a sigma defines a two disk or a copy of R2, which is a Lagrangian submanifold of xk, xk minus 1. And so instead of looking at the original pictures I had of these configurations of pairwise disjoint arcs, um, you could look at configurations involving some non-closed arcs and some arcs joining pairs of points. So, so now there exists a sort of superset of perhaps open crossingless matchings. And Lagrangians, which will vary from being products of S2s to just disks, products of R2s, via things with sort of more or fewer compact factors. And we set sort of AK hat to be the direct sum of Fleur cohomologies <coughs> over these more general open matchings. That, that Fleur cohomology is supposed to be in some kind of Picard-Zyl category? That's right. That's right. So we're using small perturbations at infinity, so this is still sort of a finite dimensional algebra. So the stuff, uh, the, the compact stuff didn't care whether you were in the wide chain or the actual Hilliard scheme. Well, um, I mean, whilst I think that might be true, uh, from a technical point of view, defining Fleur cohomology in the Hilbert scheme is of a different order of magnitude because it now contains closed rational curves. In particular, you'd have to work over a Novikov field, not over the integers or the rationals. Um, so, you know, I think it's probably true that once you take care of that, the story for the closed Lagrangians doesn't depend on the compactifying. If you wanted to set up a version of this conjecture that worked in the Hilbert scheme, then instead of introducing these non-compact objects, you should work in the affine AK surface over C star and look at crossingless matchings that are closed in that. And those two algebras are somehow quasi-hereditarily related at the cohomology level. So, but... OK, so if we could prove this, this would be, you know, so first of all, if this bigger algebra was formal, it would imply by a kind of easy restriction argument that the original algebra was formal. If this conjecture was true, then, you know, this bigger algebra would be formal for essentially stupid reasons. It would say that its only deformations are the ones where you actually change the cohomology class of the symplectic form and your Lagrangian submanifolds just physically disappear. Um, and it's some sort of, to me, reasonably intriguing motivation for introducing non-compact Lagrangians in a very concrete case where, in fact, you're only interested in the Fleur theory of the compact objects. But somehow the fact that there are non-compact Lagrangians around, bound up with them, gives you some extra traction. Okay, so let me, ne next, let me say something about a potential geometric reason why this algebra was formal which will make contact with both Jake's talk and Tobias's talk in slightly different ways. Why, why is it easy to run this computer program for the original algebra AK, but not for AK hat? No, I mean, computer experiments for AK hat confirm the idea that it's HH2 is just the dimension of YK, but that's not a proof. So this is not a conjecture that's stupidly disproved by computer experiment, but it's also not proved by computer experiment. Oh, so but I'm just not confused about what a computer can actually do. So, like, for, for <laughs> so what the computer can do is tell you that HH2 of AK hat has dimensions 1, 5, and then maybe the third one is 13, and after that it becomes intractable. But those are the sort of non-obvious ranks of the second Betty numbers of these first three spaces. Hmm. I mean, the bigger difficulty is actually symplectically Introducing it. Okay. No. 
I don't know how to compute it. That's different. Oh. Okay, so what might count as a sort of geometric reason for formality somewhere else in nature? So if M is a Kähler manifold, then the classical theorem of Deline, Griffiths, Morgan, and Sullivan says that its rational cohomology is formal. Okay, so, so for instance, um, the sort of P0 harmonic forms for the Kähler metric are exactly the same as sort of holomorphic P forms, which implies that the wedge products of P0 harmonic forms are harmonic. So so if you just looked at the sort of G harmonic forms of type star zero, you get a sort of strictly associative algebra. Which somehow, you know, in particular shows that the sort of P zero part of cohomology couldn't have any non-trivial massy products. Okay, so massy products standard obstruction to formality would be defined by the failure of having a strictly associative model. Okay, and the argument for the full cohomology is somehow the same. It comes down to this sort of DD bar lemma um, that says that all the possible Massey products on a Kähler manifold vanish coherently and that kind of coherent vanishing is reflecting some basic formality of the classical A infinity structure in cohomology. So, uh, so you could try and think about you know, the cohomology with its classical A infinity structure as the Fleur cohomology of the zero section in the cotangent bundle. And so you could wonder what's the essential geometric structure on the cotangent bundle of a Kähler manifold. And at least in a neighborhood of the origin, the structure it carries is a hyper Kähler structure, making the zero section a complex Lagrangian, a holomorphic Lagrangian in the sense of Jake's talk. So one could ask the following. It's also got a scaling action. It also has a scaling action. That's what usually gives you launch theory. I mean, you know, any manifold has a scaling action in the cotangent bundle, but it's not true that all manifolds are formal. So the fiber-wise dilation is somehow not, at least not the only essential feature. So let's recall Jake introduced complex or holomorphic Lagrangians, things that are holomorphic for one complex structure, I, in the hyperkähler family, but for which the corresponding holomorphic volume form, sort of omega j plus i omega k, k in his notation, I called it omega 2 plus i omega 3, vanish. So these are real Lagrangians with respect to a whole circle of Kähler forms. Okay. So,
So then, is the corresponding Fleur algebra formal over Q? And though I haven't written it there, the case I have in mind, I should say, first of all, this is already, again, interesting if X is exact and these Lagrangians are exact for these Kähler forms omega 2 plus I omega 3. So, um, But a situation that occurs quite often in nature is that the Lagrangians meet pairwise cleanly. So what do you get somehow automatically from the hyperkähler structure? This is a, the fact that Jake referred to. So, um, so there's a sort of easy lemma that um, if we take a generic sort of complex structure in the circle of complex structures relevant to omega 2 and omega 3, um, then every J0 holomorphic curve, sort of U sigma to X, whose boundary lies in these Li, so this could be a holomorphic curve with boundary punctures, um, is constant. So I guess I mean every holomorphic curve of finite energy, of finite area. And the proof of this is somehow just um, the following. So let's take sort of Let's take some Kähler form in our circle of forms that make these Li Lagrangian. Um, so this is compatible with compatible with the complex structure cos theta j plus sine theta k. And let's introduce the form phi. So as follows, introduce <coughs> phi to be minus sine theta omega 2 plus cos theta omega 3. Ah. Um, so the point is that, you know, this form is chosen to have sort of trivial 1-1 one, one component with respect to my compatible complex structure J0. So if I have one of these holomorphic curves with boundary inside the Li, well, then if I pull back phi by this map, then what I'm going to get is something that's built out of a naught 2 and two naught forms on the Riemann surface, so it has to vanish. But now I just play off the fact that my curve has sort of positive area, so that's some condition on its evaluation against omega naught, but this final form vanishes. So So the area of sigma is sort of cos theta times 
omega 2 evaluated on the sort of relative homology class plus sine theta times omega 3 evaluated on its homology class, which is greater than or equal to zero, but sort of phi evaluated on the homology class is minus sine theta times this plus cos theta. And this equals zero. Okay, and these have to be true for all theta in the circle. Okay, but you know, this is infinitely many equations as I vary theta in my two unknowns, omega two sigma and omega three sigma. So my only option is that actually the area is zero. So use constant. Where are we so going to use general <laughs> Okay. So, uh, I mean, you know, it might be that if I chose theta stupidly, then, you know, omega 2 and omega 3 sigma happen, you know, I mean... Yeah. Maybe not. I mean, in fact, you know, a posteriori, I couldn't need it because I could approximate things by generic theta and non-constant curves would end up being constant. But when I was running this through in my mind, at least this was obviously forcing the error to vanish by varying theta. I'm confused. I'm sorry, I'm confused why I allowed to vary theta because it appears in the sum of J zero. We're looking at J zero. Yeah, so, so the statement is that if J zero is generic, then every curve is constant. Okay. okay. So I have two sort of fixed values, omega two sigma and omega three sigma. Okay. okay. By varying theta, theta okay. there, will be a choice of there will be a choice of theta for which you can't solve those I can't solve these equations. Okay. Sorry, that was said badly. Okay, so the point is that as in Tobias's talk, we're in a situation where everything interesting that happens in Fleur theory here comes from constant maps, much like the zero section in the cotangent bundle. But we know plenty of situations in which moduli spaces of constant maps do contribute interestingly. So in our situation, in our setup, um, So this is determined by constant holomorphic disks. And on the other hand, the moduli spaces of constant disks, at least if these Lagrangians meet pairwise cleanly, are themselves Kähler manifolds, which are formal. So, of course, you know, you can take two circles on a punctured elliptic curve. The only interesting holomorphic disks that contribute to their A infinity structure are constant, and the moduli spaces of constant disks are points, and the point is also a Kähler manifold, so formal. So somehow, you know, this data alone cannot be enough by some purely general or algebraic argument to imply formality. Um, on the other hand, you know, the simplest setting that I might have for this question is one complex Lagrangian sitting locally inside its own cotangent bundle. And you know, the formality this is asking about is exactly the deline griffiths morgan sullivan theorem. Perhaps the next simplest question you could look at is when the complex Lagrangians are themselves of lowest possible dimension, just curves, and you're working inside a hypercalar surface, and the situation of these Milner fibers of type ADE are exactly going through the cases in which you would get sort of such an interesting question. Okay, so, uh, so finally, just as a remark. Um, there are no Lagrangians in compact hypercalar surfaces? So there are, um, I mean, you could take Lagrangian spheres in a K3 surface, for instance, and ask this same question. Uh, I mean, I think that once you've decided that 
all of the curves are constant. You can localize the computation to a neighborhood of the Lagrangian spheres, and you essentially return yourself to one of the sort of, you know, plumbing configurations of spheres of ADE type, at least generically. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's more you could do. You could take, of course, things that aren't spheres. And then this, um, and quite thinking, there's no disks basically count. Then this algebra is just, it's just purely about the combinatorics of how these various spheres intersect. So, um, I mean, there are always constant holomorphic maps. And constant holomorphic maps can contribute, interestingly, to the product structure in this algebra. So one shouldn't think that constants never tell you anything interesting. They certainly do tell you something interesting because these things tend to be, you know, interesting algebras. Um, the question is, you know, a constant map is a natural thing to have, you know, two Lagrangians naturally meet. So it's not so implausible that there's a constant map at the pair. You know, three or more Lagrangians shouldn't meet at a point. So as soon as you're looking at constant maps to higher A infinity structures, I mean, naively, even to the product, you know, you've already put yourself in a non-generic situation from the point of view of perturbations. On the other hand, if I give you complex Lagrangians, you know, it seems very unfortunate to perturb them, destroying their nice geometric structure in order to achieve transversality and have them intersect pairwise transversely. This is a situation which seems somehow God-given for trying to approach via some sort of more sophisticated technique that inputs, you know, non-transverse moduli spaces, because here it seems that the interesting geometric structure is precisely on those non-transverse moduli spaces of constants. So uh, I'm out of time, but just to remark that um, the space YK that I talked about is a quiver variety. If you know what that means, then that's fine. Um, if you don't, then, you know, we're basically over anyway, so who cares? In particular, it's hypercalar. Uh, and as a hypercalar manifold, it retracts to a union of finitely many complex Lagrangian submanifolds, which are indexed by the crossingless matchings row I talked about before. So it contains sort of God-given Lagrangians which are complex, um, sort of let me call them L hat row, indexed by the matchings row. But just as a straight sort of symplectic topology question, it seems not obvious to us uh, that these Lagrangians are actually Hamiltonian isotopic to the Lagrangians that I built naively by taking products of spheres in these Milner fibers. No. Um, do those the Lagrangians intersect cleanly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so, sort of a straight symplectic topology question, and um, is so these so th these complex Lagrangians are just the compact core; they're the resolution of the sort of relevant adjoint quotient fiber over zero. Um, is L rho Hamiltonian isotopic? to L hat row. And you know, I think there's a lot of reason to believe this is true. And if this was true, then you know, a positive answer to this question in this case would give some kind of perhaps more intuitive explanation for the formality theorem that Mohammed and I proved that I stated at the beginning. And conversely, you could view our theorem as you know, addif additional evidence that maybe there's meat to this conjecture. We've proved it in some other non-trivial case. OK, I'll stop there. Questions for Adam. So have you thought about the, what happens when the characteristic is non-zero? Uh, yeah, so uh, if I'd reached pages three, four, and five of my notes, that would have come up a bit. Um, there's a pretty observation due to um, Paul Seidel and uh, Politarczyk, a uh, Polish student, that shows that um, at least in the presence of certain symmetries, uh, this, so there's a certain involution you can consider on this space, and our space is not equivariantly formal over Z mod 2. And I suspect that it's probably not formal over Z mod 2. And 
I referred to these results of Etgu and Lekeli on the D and E type Milner fibers. And in type D, they really do prove formality holds away from these certain characteristics and fails to hold in characteristic two. So, you know, as in the classical formality of chains on a Kähler manifold, sort of zero characteristic seems to be not just an artifice of the proof. Is there any analogy with rational homotopy theory that you know this algebra is formal and extracts and makes some homotopy theoretic calculations? Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps, but I haven't actually thought about that. Um, certainly, you know, <clears throat> I would say once you know it's formal, that has consequences for the sort of global symplectic topology of this space that, you know, haven't been systematically explored but should be. Um, but whether or not you can do something more closely inspired by rational homotopy theory, I don't know. It's a good idea. So, uh, I have a question about symplectic quantum homology. Um, you've got this YK, it's got a compact coil, which is a ground which things that can clean you. You might believe that the entire category of YK is like microlocal sheaves on the compact coil. Can you define symplectic quantum homology from that point of view? Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> maybe. I mean, I certainly couldn't, but. What is true is that um, the fact that this algebra is formal identifies it with a subalgebra of Katerina's algebra, which is known to be controlled by perverse sheaves on the Grassmannian by the work of Braden. So you could wonder whether or not the same combinatorics that you would need for the compact core shows up naturally in the Schubert stratification of the Grassmannian of K-planes in 2K space. And if so, it might follow relatively straightforwardly from her work that one could do that. Um, can you say a little more about the symplectic geometric consequences of formality? Um, so I would say that I don't understand, you know, much straight coming from formality, but the way we prove formality, do I? Sorry, ma'am is scowling, sorry. maybe. Um, I'm wondering, well, you should finish your answer. So, uh, so we prove this space is formal by building an HH1 class with certain properties. And there is a general relationship between Hochschild cohomology and symplectic cohomology, this rather geometric invariant that Frederic introduced. So in the simplest examples of these Milner fibers, one can show that when viewed as an SH1 class, the class we build satisfies a certain natural condition with respect to this BV operator that Frederick also talked about, which is the dilation condition introduced by Jake Solomon and Paul Seidel. The presence of a dilation has immediate consequences, for instance, for the existence of Lagrangian submanifolds. You know, it rules out Ki ones or things like that. Um, one slightly annoying thing is that symplectic cohomology has good restriction properties, which is where these constraints come from. But naively, Hochschild cohomology does not behave well under restriction. It's somehow covariant in one variable and contravariant in another. So until you've interpreted it as SH star, it seems slightly less obvious to me. I mean, we don't quite have the dilation condition. We have something that's sort of strictly different. Um, but one should somehow explore whether or not the existence of a pure vector field, which is what we have, just rules out Lagrangians, and if you can then use a restriction technology to get the same conclusions? I would guess yes, but we haven't done that. Sorry, I just want to say you have to be a bit careful about saying what is formal and what yes. is not. Right. The entire formal category isn't formal. And the most you can hope for here is that we have some collection of Lagrangians which sometimes generate the Fukai category, whose Fleur theory happens to be formal. But there could be another collection of Lagrangians which also generate the Fukai category, whose Fleur theory is not formal. In fact, you can easily make it up by taking these guys and adding one extra you know, redundant object to it, or cone of a morphism. So, anyway, I mean, I think that the question of consequences is good, but it's unlike for spaces where there's kind of, it's obvious what we're talking about to just cohomology of the space that we're interested in. Here, when we're talking about formality of the Sakai category, it's not that clear what we're exactly saying. Yeah, but in this one, it wasn't. Isn't that the example you're looking at is one of the things that Elsa was talking about, isn't it? That 
it, or it's some, sometimes this is a, those, this Milner fiber would be the uh, um, uh, Lando Ginsburg thing to uh, to to some Calabiao, the mirror to some Calabiao, and and in this in those cases this this bunch of these bunch of things they generate this what do they call it the Seidel category, right? The, the I mean. The Seidel category is really generated by the sort of corresponding non-compact things, these vanishing thimbles, rather than by the spheres. So these aren't quite the objects that show up in that sort of directed category that you think of as analogous to the sort of thing with an exceptional collection. Um, so, you know, yeah. Well, while, while the word mirror symbol comes up, is there an analogous statement somewhere? Analogous statement to what? Formality. Is there some derived category somewhere, some object in it? So you can take the derived category of coherent sheaves on the resolution of the zero fiber with compact support on this collection of complex Lagrangians. So Countess and Kamnitz have built a braid group action on that essentially by hand and showed that you recover Kavanov homology. Uh, their theory is bigraded, and I would guess that starting from the fact that it's bigraded, you could prove formality for the corresponding algebra in their setup, but they didn't prove their theorem that way. They took a different route via building tangle invariance, which bypassed the need for formality. Well, the corresponding algebra is, like you said, the endomorphism? Endomorphisms of the direct sum of the structure sheaves. We should take a break. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's thank Ivan again.